Hi everyone, good evening and welcome to another lecture series for employee training and development. So for the past uh, weeks, we've been discussing about the things that uh, make us improve our awareness, the different processes and theories behind uh, employee training and development. Uh, we've been discussing last week, um, the basis of conducting uh, an effective and science-based uh, employee training development is that and that will be possible with the need of needs assessment. This is an overall part of a two-part series in um, creating employee training development. So the first part was um, knowing the, uh, the background on training and development. So we discuss about the introduction in strategic training and right now to make the strategic training and development possible we'll be moving on moving forward on a different um, application different steps real steps in conducting um, training and development and we had it first with um, creating your needs assessment right now is uh, doing training of course we'll be doing a transfer of information will be our learners are expecting to be learning something out from the training so right now we'll be talking about uh, learning and transfer of training right so this will be the next chapter for our discussion this is employee training and development. Learning and transfer of training. This is on the fourth chapter of our main reference for our textbook. So there are several objectives again being um, discussed here. So at the end of this uh, lecture series, um, learners and perhaps students will be able to discuss the five types of learner outcomes. Um, uh, as um, train trainees training in the making or in training you are expected to to have the skills of trainers somewhat similar by teacher you'll be developing your own learner outcomes second is to be using or utilizing different learning theories that will help you uh, create your own uh, training program which is of course the the integration of different uh, different theories and information third is since we are doing adult learning of course you'll be having a, a quick background of adult learning and how are we going to put this um, theory in practice in creating your own training program next at the end of this lecture series, um, learners know how should know how uh, trainees or learners process, receive, store, retrieve, and act upon information. So this is talking or tackling about the application of cognitive some cognitive theories in the context of training and development. Next is uh, we as learners at the end of this you'll be discussing the internal conditions and external conditions necessary for a trainee to learn each type of capability. Next is, at the end of this, uh, you'll be able to discuss the implications of open and closed skills and near and far transfer for designing training programs. And uh, you should be able to explain the features of instruction in the work environment that are necessary for learning and transfer of training because in learning, it's not just we give information, but also the environment where our trainees are doing the training would definitely have an impact on the overall um, effect, effectivity of the training. I mean, the goals of the training, right? So just a quick introduction again. I've um, just mentioned earlier that training is not just about um, imparting knowledge giving information to our trainees and to our <clears throat> to the people but also it should have at least the following checklist in order to have a successful training or transfer of uh, learning for example so number one um, in order for it to be effective there should be an opportunities for trainees to practice and receive feedback 
um, this is one way of <clears throat> saying to trainees that the things that need that they need to be that needs to be done well what are the things for improvement what are their strengths for example because without feedbacking um, trainees will not know what are the things that needs to be improved Next will be offer meaningful training content uh, because once trainees will find the meaning and um, um, in, uh, in the, if they are passionate in what they are doing in the training, of course, they, are, they will be uh, more engaged. And when people tend to become engaged um, in the study of flow and engagement with Csikszent Mihai on his research um, if people who are engaged and passionate or in the state of flow in whatever they are doing they tend to become more satisfied and of course uh, happier in their uh, in their task or in their overall well-being so yeah that's the, the the objective of offer meaningful training content to the trainees next is identify any prerequisite that trainees need to complete the program successfully because um, depending on the training content because some training programs require prior knowledge or prior information to a specific um, subject matter so for example um, the context of um, communication training so you cannot go level 2 communication training if you cannot do the um, level 1 communication training and so on and so forth and um, this is also common to other uh, programs or other subject matter, regardless of any training. Next, um, that should be tackled or should be present so that learning should occur, is that allow trainees to learn through observation and experience and ensure that the work environment supports the use of skills. Um, in psychology, for example, it has been... Um, hypothesized and argued that the more we practice um, um, certain habits it will um, be uh, we'll be able to learn motor skills and physical skills and it's also same with training the more we practice and the more that the environment is of course um, supportive with uh, with uh, endeavors and of course, training will become successful. And we'll be talking more about social learning, which is this checklist is somewhat fit or related to social learning theory, right? So before we continue, we'll be, uh, we should be able to enumerate or somewhat have a description to what are the ter terms that we are using here in this lecture series. So we're talking about transfer of learning, transfer of training. Uh, so here, here are our definitions. So transfer of training. So this is when trainees effectively and continually applying what they have learned in the training to their jobs. We can say that there is an effective training or we can say that effective training is equal to transfer of training is that if the trainee was able to utilize what he or she has learned during the training on his current work so for example um, a great example here is what we call the internships or the on the job trainings for students so they are expected that um, they are undergoing the training the ojt or the internship because at the end of the um, of their program, for example, or their course, for example, in the context of psychology um, programs, um, um, undergraduate degree in psychology. So at the end of it, they'll be able to practice and continue the um, the information or the techniques or skills that they have learned. So for example, in counseling, so they'll be working or having internship on a um, counseling centers, right? So once they are done with their degree, then they can perhaps work again on, a, on the same or in the different counseling centers and apply their prior knowledge and skills that they have heard on their, of their experience to their current work. So okay, this is transfer of training. Generalization here is the trainee's ability to apply what they learn on the job work problem. So uh, this is the integration of uh, previous information from um, real life situation experiences. For example, uh, during the training, uh, when an, a trainee has realized that this um, 
problem is somewhat similar to the problem that he or she is experiencing in work, then perhaps he, he or she can do some synthesis and tweak some factors that would help him or her achieve his goal. So in the context, again, of um, internship, and the, and the counseling centers. So uh, we can say that there is generalization if um, the trainee was able to um, integrate and synthesize that um, uh, depressed people, for example, regardless of what status they have or um, socioeconomic status, educational background, they have similar um, core symptoms, which is in line to a diagnostic criteria, right? So uh, that's somewhat an insight or a generalization from the trainee's perspective. Maintenance here, on the other hand, is the process of trainees continuing to use of what they have learned over time. So they are extending right now what they have learned before and then trying to modify, try to extend it so that it will retain on their mind or in their selves. So here is table 4.1, uh, a sample of learning outcomes. I've mentioned earlier, um, as training, train, trainers in training, right? That's the term, trainee, trainees in training, or trainers in the making, you are expected to create your own learning outcomes. And that we have here, um, there are five different learning outcomes. We start with verbal information, intellectual skills, motor skills, attitudes, cognitive strategy. So when you draft your own learning outcomes, it should at least encompass this five minimum type of learning outcomes. So when we talk about verbal information, this is um, the capacity of, for example, state or tell or uh, describe previously stored information. Example here is state three reasons of the following company safety procedures. So it's more on enumerating. Right? Next, we have intellectual skills. So um, it's re referring to how we um, apply generalized concepts, rules to solve problems, and generate the products. So for example here, design and code a computer program. So it's mostly how a person processes nonverbal and verbal stimulus, right? Motor skills is referring here to physical action. So um, depending on what training. So at the end of the training, um, in the example here, trainees will be able to shot a gun and consistently hit a small moving target. Or for example, um, be able to move. So at the end of training, trainees will be able to operate a machine or a computer or a printer or whatever machine it may. Next is attitude. This is uh, referring to personality and uh, other inter um, intrapersonal characteristics of a person. Right. And last is cognitive strategies, uh, how a person manages his own thinking and learning processes. So different ways or different utilization of learning styles here. So table 4.1 here is the model of learning and transfer of learning. So we have here um, three characteristics. Number one is trainee characteristics, which was discussed and explored on the previous chapter when we talk about needs analysis, specifically person analysis. So we're able to know um, what the person is. What are the characteristics of the trainees? Second is we have training design. So we'll be talking more on training design as we go along the chapter. So this will be discussed on the following chapters, how we create and draft our own training. And lastly will be the work environment. So this is where are we going to conduct the training? So since most of us right now are working virtually, so it is expected that training are done right now, virtual or online. So these all three characteristics uh, contributes to the learning, right? And our goal, once um, if there is learning that is happening, there should be transfer of training, right? So that is how we generalize, uh, how trainees generalize the learning and how they maintain it, maintain it, right? Right, so here are the different, um, Perhaps I can say the most common learning theories that has been existing or utilized by trainees, trainers and, and training development. So we have reinforcement theory, social learning theory, goal theories, need theories, expectancy theory, adult learning theory, information processing theory. 
I will not discuss one by one on the different types of theory because this is not um, theories of learning, but this is uh, training and development. However, we'll just be utilizing or applying um, theories of learning in the context of employee training and development. So perhaps I can just give you an overview of the different learning theories. Right. Number one is what we call the learning um, theories and uh, re sorry, a uh, reinforcement theory. So um, the tenet here is that um, this is part of the bigger um, pillars of psychology and we we'll call it behaviorism. So behaviorism emerged um, uh, on, the, on the turn of the century when when people discovered that people's behavior can be controlled. And that people are like machines. Their tenet is that people are like machines. I mean, we can control our behavior by punishment, by rewards, and by reinforcements. Right. So that's the tenet here. We can reward. We can we can expect a person to do a particular behavior if we reward or punish a person or an animal. So two notable persons here. We have Ivan Pavlov and of course um, B. F. Skinner. So Pavlov was known for the dog experiment, when the salivate, when the ring bell, when the when the bell rings. I'm sorry for that. When the bell rings, and then the the dog will salivate, and then the dog will associate the bell with food, etc., etc. And we have Skinner with his famous experiment with the rat on his Skinner's box. So whenever the the rat will pull or touch the lever of course pellet food pellets will come out of the box and then the rat have learned that by pulling the the trigger of course the food will be released right so that reinforces the behavior and um if punishment was given like for example every time the the lever was um pull an a sh um um electric shock will be sent or to the rat and that the rat will be punished and that of course there is also learning a reinforcement negative reinforcement on the rat so those were the tenets here so the the task right now for trainees is how are we going to apply these concepts in the context of training development how do we give um, rewards how do we give punishments right how do we give reinforcements right another uh, famous um, learning theories is from um, Another big pillar of psychology, and this is on the um, social learning theory. So the tenet here, uh, we have a very famous uh, person here. I, I believe he, that the person is still alive. It's Albert Bandura, um, known for this theory of social learning theory. So the, the tenet of social learning theory is somewhat a hybrid between um, behaviorism and humanism because on the behaviorism they view a human as a machine but on the social learning theory they view a human being as a machine at the same time has the capacity to think and to rationalize on his own so they emphasize that people learn by observing other persons or models whom they follow and are credible and knowledgeable so the environment here plays a vital uh, role in developing certain behaviors so the environment the internal thinking um, influences how the people behave, how people behave, right? So the theory recognizes that behavior, of course, is reinforced and rewarded and tends to be repeated. Again, this is the tenet of behaviorism that social learning theory has somewhat copied and modified on their own, right? A very famous experiment on this one is on the Popo doll when um, children was um, given a video clip, a violent one, and then of course, as children, they followed the violent behavior. So somewhat, the environment influences the behavior of the children. So it's a famous experiment. Yeah. And the, um, with social learning theories, there's a lot of theories of motivation that is associated with theory. And one of it is what we call person self-efficacy. So it is a belief that a person has the capacity to achieve his own goals. Right? So that's self-efficacy. 
and it can be increased by several methods. We have here verbal persuasion, logical verification, observation of others, and of course the other term that is modeling and of course past accomplishments. So figure 4.2 here is the process of social learning theory. So we start with attention, with the stimuli of course, with the training in the person and the characteristics. Second is the retention, how the information should be retained in the brain or in the mind of the person. So we start with coding, with schemas, and with the organi organization of these codes in the brain. Next is motor reproduction, how the person makes physical um, movements. How is he going to translate into physical movements? The things that has retained on his mind. And lastly, motivational processes, and that is referring to motivations. I mean, reinforcements. And of course, that would lead to match model performance. Another theory here is what we call the goal theory, which is assumes that behavior results from a person's conscious goals and intentions. So this is the very, uh, perhaps one of the mo uh, one of the directive co um, mod models of um, learning because this is very structured in a way because um, the goals are enumerated and um, with each goals there are specific strategies strategies number one strategies number two um, strategy number three for goal number two so it's very specific and very structured and which is kind of um, what makes this um, theory very unique and stand out from other theories right Needs theories, on the other hand, is the humanistic aspect of learning and behavior. So this is very opposite to the very opposite to the goal setting and to the um, be, um, reinforcement theory because they view human beings they are driven to move or to be, they are motivated because they have their own needs, right? And this is somewhat aligned to the um, core theories of Maslow with his hierarchy of needs. And with Alfred Fedler's needs theories, right? So you know, um, the needs, I mean, there is a deficiency, and that is the need, and people are motivated to um, to get the need because we are people, and we are people are hungry for that need, right? So we have um, this need theory has several sub theories we have alfedler we have Muslow, we have mcleland and so on and so forth expectancy theory here is somewhat related to the three factors or domains on this theory so we have expectancies instrumentality and valence so figure 4.3 here explains the expectancy theory of motivation so when you talk about expectancy it's referring to the expected a uh, task that is, should be completed and for a task to be completed there should be an effort an effort is equal to performance so perhaps we can ask um, some questions regarding does a trainee have the ability to learn uh, does a trainee believe that he or she can learn so that's referring to self-efficacy right expectancy right how, what do we expect to our trainees? Next is we have instrumentality. So once we are done identifying that our trainees can perform and they believe that they can perform, then we'll be asking, um, does the trainee believe training outcomes promised will be delivered? So is the performance will lead to a specific outcome? Right? Does the performance of the trainees will lead to a specific goal? that is aligned with, uh, for example, with the goal of the organization, with the goal of training, right? So that is the goal of instrumentality. And lastly, the balance or the value of the outcome. Are the outcomes related to the training value? Uh, are the outcomes related to the goals of the overall organization? And that is referring to balance. When we multiply all of these three, that will equal to effort, right? And right now, um, I mentioned earlier that we're talking about adult learning theory, and it's very crucial because when we train employees within an organization, I assume that they are not minors and most of them are adults, right? So we have different learning theories, right? So we have a pedagogy. So pedagogy is a theory of um, children learning. But since we're talking about adults, we will be talking on andragogy, 
So theory of adult learning. Um, just just to sum up the assumptions of theory of um, adult learning, since adults are autonomous, um, they are more independent compared to children. When we conduct training, it should be modeled to the point that um, the adults have the capacity to become independent. They can be on their own because if not, they will perhaps they will they will be bored. They will not find engagement and they will not be in the flow on the training they will be demotivated because they cannot be on their own they cannot be who they are because as adults adults tend to value independence right so we should align our training in line to adult learning theory and just, just to sum it up um it should be collaborative we should put we should think that our trainees has the capacity, they have already the existing skills, and we should not treat them, we should not spoon feed them with the information because, again, they have the prior experience, they have the prior knowledge, they have the prior wisdom, which will already help them um, become successful in this training. So we should draft a training that is somewhat really, I mean, that is really in line with adult learning theory or andragogy. So these are the implications of adult learning theory. Right? Number one, we have self-concept, experience, readiness, time perspective, and orientation to learning. So when we practice adult learning for training, then of course, um, it has somewhat issues or challenges that trainees might encounter. Number one is the self-concept. So this is referring to how um, an individual views himself or herself. So the, perhaps the implications for this is mutual planning and collaboration in instruction. So when we talk about individuality and autonomy, so yeah, there will be somewhat the challenges on how we, of course, relate to other people and do collaborative works. Next is experience. And um, our implications for this one is that um, use learner experience as basis for examples in application and the experience itself will be somewhat a challenge as well because different challenges i mean different experiences might have might um, collide or contrast or they may not agree the trainees may not agree with a single experience that's why open communication is very crucial here and we have of course um, readiness as well time perspective and orientation to learning so these all contribute to design issues and as trainees in training you should take note of the different design issues all right and the, the i think this is perhaps the last uh call this um, theory of learning and this is quite unique this is the information processing theory unlike the other learning theories which um, base their core philosophy on rewards punishment um, goals needs of the person the, this this type of learning theory focuses on how a person perceives and processes information Right, so this this is somewhat related or somewhat connected to cognitive psychology and how we process information, how we process stimulus. Right. So here we have this is just to sum up everything. So this is how um a, a person normally process information. So number one, um a person um should react um should see is something or there should be a message coming from a stimulus right because that's the time that we perceive things so if perhaps we 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 perceive things i mean we react to something that is not existing on the clinical perspective perhaps the person might have um, hallucinations or delusions right so it's really important um that um, people should um, react to something if there is a message or a stimulus and then of course when there is a stimulus our physical body or sensory organs will the one who will capture that message or the stimulus so we have the eyes for it we have the ears nose and skin and then um, our sensory or receptors again then this will be all encoded in our brain sensory register and then it will be converted into either short-term memory or or, or into our long-term memory 
and then our brain will respond um, a specific action and then it will be done by effectors and it will be feedback in our environment. So a very concrete example for this one is um, durian, for example, a very famous king of the fruit. So a lot of people do, doesn't like durian because um, the smell is too strong, it's too pungent for them. So if you're a person who doesn't like durian and then you you smell the smell of, uh, you smell the, the aroma of durian, like, one kilometers away from your point of reference so your your nose will smell the strong and pungent smell it will sense in your it will register in your brain so you put it on your long-term memory you will register it that this is the aroma of a durian and then your response generator your brain will generate to move away or cover your nose and effectors and then you'll feed back to your environment you'll tell your friend that durian stinks it doesn't smell good right so that's how we process information so the 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 challenge here i mean the the next main thing here is how are we going to apply this information processing in the context of training and development right so here is transfer of training theory so um, what are the different theories that would help us understand how training are transferred to trainees effectively? Right. Uh, transfer of training is more difficult when tasks during training are different from the work environment. Of course, this is this this is this is very uh, crucial and somewhat practical because um, how can we how can we know that the training is effective if there is transfer of learning if what has been learned has not been applied and it's not related to what is the current job or task right so here table 4.3 is the transfer of training theories and there are three here so, um, we have identical elements stimulus generalization and cognitive theory right identical elements is referring to training environment is identical to work environment so the type of transfer here is near and going back to our example of the internship practicum or ojt or on the job trainings uh, the the tenet here is that we do internships or ojts because they simulate real work environment so at the end of the program or the course of the student, they will be working on the same field or similar working space, right? So what has learned on the internship will be similar to the real work after the graduation. So that is the tenet why um, OJT has been practiced for quite a long time now. And that's what we call the identical elements there, right? Second is we have the stimulus generalization. So it's when general principles are applicable to many different work situations or so environments and predictable and highly variable. For example, training in interpersonal skills. So this is referring to um, principles that are somewhat different. So this is when um, the trainees has the capacity to apply different insights in different working situations. For example, what has been learned in the OJT can also be applied on this uh, on task one, on task two, on different departments as well. So um, the type of transfer here is quite far as compared to the identical elements. And lastly, we have the cognitive theory. So this is really how we construct schemas in our minds. So schemas are framework and how we enhance our storage and our memories in recalling this information, right? So it's the transfer, of, uh, the type of transfer here is both near and far. So right now uh, we'll talk about the learning process um, how does learning occur or how does it happen right so learning process is both mental and physical processes so we have here expectancy perception working storage semantic encoding so these all came from the cognitive psychology these all um, were borrowed from cognitive psychology so um, expectancy here is referring to mental state that the learner brings to the instructional process and uh, yeah, it's really the expectancy. So how um, are we expecting the learners or the trainees or individuals to to perceive on how on how 
um, the person um, dif uh, infuses the the processes, the different instructions. Perception here is the ability to perceive and to organize the message, how to make meaning out from the information from the instructional processes. Working storage here is um, rehearsal and repetition of information of information. So it's how uh, it's a storage in the brain, it's per cognitive psychology, and then it's it's where our memories are are being practiced and rehearsed. Uh, semantic encoding is actual coding of, of process of incoming information. Right. And aside from the processes, we have the strategies. We have here the rehearsal, organizing, and elaboration. So rehearsal here is focused on how we practice, how we repeat certain um, information, right? How we rehearse, um, um, perhaps read or elaborate a specific um, information. Organizing here is um, requires the learner to find similarities and themes of the material. So that's how we compare and contrast, how we put insights, how we um, how we connect. Right? And lastly, elaboration is mostly on synthesis. It's how we apply the learnings on the training and to other context. And we have here the cycle of learning. It's concrete experience, reflective observation, abstract conceptualization, and active experimentation. Right? So these are the different um, learning styles, table 4.5. So we have four different learning styles, diverger, assimilator, converger, and accommodator. So if you're interested to, um, to know your different learning styles, you can just search Google and look for learning styles questionnaires it's available for free um, you can you can just um, take it online and the results will show you what type of learning styles it's very um, important because certain learning um, styles has its own strengths and weaknesses and this is very somewhat related to personality as well uh, I'm not yet updated to the current studies on this one but uh, the important here is that certain personality types and also certain learning styles has its own techniques and own skills and advantages. And it's all seen here on table 4.5. So as trainers in training, you should have at least an information of how or what are the different strategies on, on how your uh, trainees um, um, learn because this will be this will be also one of your guide or checklist in doing your training, implementing your training to the trainees, right? So again, um, we have here the learning process and we start with the instruction, the training context and the practice, right? And table 4.6 here, is the features of instruction and work environment that facilitate learning and transfer of training. So we have here a uh, several um, lists here and um, supposed to be there should be a group um, a group discussion and breakout rooms but since um, due to our schedules and different uh, class conditions we cannot uh, do this but nonetheless um what do you think would be the the best features of instruction that really um, facilitate transfer of training right please let me know your answers by the comment section below and what do you think is the least please let me know your answers and i'll be glad to answer your comments All right, so right now is we'll talk more on the instruction or how we're going to um, um, put, um, deliver the contents of our training to our trainees. So there, have been, there has been three types of interaction here. Number one is learner content, learner, learner, learner instructor. So when you talk about learner content, it's, it somewhat requires mastering the task and then focus on the, on the content of training. So there is really no interaction with other people. So and the interaction here is just done by the learner itself and the content itself of the training, 
right? The learner learner, on the other hand, is quite opposite because there has already been an interaction between the learner itself and the other learner or the peers of the learner. So um, there is already a human interaction about uh, that's coming inside here. So it requires master a task that is completed in a group. The learners should gain new knowledge or validate their understanding by discussing with other learners. And lastly, the learner instructor. So an interaction between the learner and the instructor or the trainer. So this is um, best in uh, for in-depth topic exploration and develop strengths in critical analysis and thinking. Um, this is now the, um, uh, perhaps the other techniques that we can use because the instructor here is expected to be more knowledgeable than the learner. So there is a transfer of more experiences and skills coming from the instructor. Right. So um, in a general, in a nutshell, uh, how can we um, give um, encouragement to trainees in terms of um, success of the training in the long run? Right. So we go on number one for, of course, with self-management. So it's how a person controls a certain context of his or her life. And it's how uh, the challenge now is how we instill this concept of self-management to our trainees. Next is we have lapses. So this takes place when a trainee uses previously learned less effective capabilities instead of trying to apply the capability emphasized in the training program. So perhaps we have a lot of factors being here um, that needs to be addressed. For example, um, learned knowledge before, culture, acceptance to changes, openness to change, personality types. There are certain personality types that um, are not mostly open to changes. Right, because it's part of a new pie, a new pie personality domains. Right? Next is we have climate for transfer. So trainees' perceptions about a wide variety of characteristics of the work environment that facilitate or inhibit the use of trained skills or behavior. So this is really um, how um, certain situations or environments and how a trainee perceives that environment could also be a hindrance or could help facilitate the transfer of learning, right? So here, table 4.3 are examples of obstacles in the work environment that inhibit transfer of training. So we have um, several identified factors here um, about influence. We have time pressure, equipment, um, budget constraints, a lack of peer support, support from others. Um, from co-workers, for example, lack of management support, um, and etc. and etc. So what do you think is the um, factor or the the obstacles that really inhibits the performance of I um, mean the transfer of training on uh, trainees? Please let me know your answers in the comment section below. Okay. So here, we have also instructional emphasis for learning outcomes. So again, I've mentioned earlier, we have two factors here, the internal and the external factors. So these two factors um, is what will contribute or what will somewhat influence the learning outcomes of our training. So internal conditions here are referring to processes within the learner that must be present for learning to occur. So it's on the, for example, motivation have self-efficacy, how the capable or how the trainees process information, how adequate the um, trainee utilizing his skills and strengths. We have also cognitive abilities, reading abilities, etc. External conditions here are referring, um, are referring to processes in the learning environment to facilitate learning. This could include the physical learning environment, the people outside the trainee, the training, the trainees, the people, or the trainees where um, the train, the people that the trainees in, uh, are interacting with, right? And since right now most of the trainings are done virtually because of the pandemic, so what do you think will be the implications of um, doing trainings virtually or doing trainings online? Right? Please let me know your answers again by answering or um, putting your answers in the comment section below.
I'll be glad to answer your questions. Right. So table 4.50 here are the internal and external conditions necessary for learning outcomes. So when crafting your own learning outcomes, you should take note of the following um, um, both internal and external conditions, right? So, so we have here learning outcomes. We have the verbal information, intellectual skills, cognitive strategies, attitudes, and motor skills. Again, it's somewhat related to the learning outcomes earlier, but it has its own um, separate internal and external conditions, and it has its own um, characteristics. So as train trainers in training, you should take note of this stuff in creating your own learning outcomes all right so yeah that's the end of, of our lecture series and if you have any questions please let me know by um writing your questions on the comment section below or you can also um message me you can message me on email you can send an email to me um, just also, also that we can perhaps do a um, consultation online. Just to message me. Also, I'm available in Messenger, right? So, yeah, in a nutshell, so this is very important. The, this chapter is very crucial as well because um, we will be guided by this um, different theories and processes in conducting um, an evidence-based uh, training program to our trainees. So. Um, see you soon in our um, next lecture series. And uh, yeah, uh, that will be all for now. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day ahead. Goodbye for now.